I'm Pam Larickia, and this is episode number 158 of the podcast. It's the 9th of January, 2019, as I record this intro. So this week on the podcast, Tracy Talvera and Erica Ellis join me to talk about their Unschooling Book Club. Last year, Tracy connected with me to say they were doing my book, Free to Learn, in their book club, and I ended up doing a kind of video conference with them about the book during one of their meetings. It was a lot of fun. And actually, I had no idea until we chatted for the podcast that it was actually the first book that they did together. So that was cool. I had asked her about the group, and she sent me some great information about how it works. And then I thought it would be a lot of fun to have her and Erica on the podcast. If you're curious about it or contemplating starting a book club of your own, I think you'll find the information they share really helpful. I've also just created a page on my website for book clubs. It has some information to help you get started. Plus, uh, there's discussion questions for my most recent book, The Unschooling Journey, A Field Guide. So whether or not you choose to use the questions as is, hopefully they'll help get the juices flowing. So you can find that at livingjoyfully.ca forward slash book clubs, all one word. As a personal update, things are slowly getting back into routine. But they're still feeling fresh. I love that. And I'm still enjoying that New Year energy and thinking about everything through this kind of new lens of 2019. But Michael's back to work. Lissy's visiting friends. Joseph's taking the lead with a puppy who's settling in really well and changing and growing practically every day. As for his name, I think we've officially settled on Nero. He's an all-black chug, and Nero means black in Italian, and it just seems to fit him really well. And as always, I want to thank everyone who has chosen to support my unschooling work like this podcast and my website through Patreon. And a big welcome to new patrons, Katya Maciel, I hope that's right, Katya, and NJ. I deeply appreciate all my patrons. Their generous support is vital to helping me freely share information and inspiration with anyone who's curious and wants to explore the fascinating world of unschooling. I sent out the January desktop wallpaper image the other day, and I'm just about to schedule the video chat for this month. So if you'd like to join my community of patrons and scoop up some great rewards along the way, check out the Exploring Unschooling page at patreon.com. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash exploring unschooling. And with that, let's get to my conversation with Tracy and Erica. Welcome. I'm Pam Larickia from livingjoyfully.ca and today I'm here with Tracy Talavera and Erica Ellis. Hi guys. Hi, Hi. Pam Larickia. This is very now, exciting. Tracy and Erica host an unschooling book club and I've had a lot of fun connecting with their group through doing a couple of book chats with them over the last year or so. And I was thrilled when they agreed to join me and share a bit about their experience with that. And to get us started, can you each share with us a bit about you and your family? And how about you go first, Tracy? Okay. Um, I am Tracy Talavera. And when I was 28, I went to live in Madrid, Spain for a year. And during that time, I met my husband, Enrique. Uh, We married five months after meeting, and it's been 16 years. He is a true blue family man, and I cry a lot. (laughs) (laughs) I'm I'm just letting you know that I'm the crier in the book club. So, Um, (laughs) And I've I've learned so much about relationships and family through my relationship with him. Um, We lived in L.A. for a while. We lived in New York City. And then we settled back in my hometown of Miami, Florida, because we wanted to start having babies. And um, we have a 10-year-old daughter that is very loving, affectionate, and empathetic person that loves to eat cookies. Mm -hmm. Um, Our six-year-old is so funny and saucy. When I was I was practicing reading this and she heard me in the other room and she I hear her, that's right, I'm saucy. <laughs> um, and saucy and knows exactly what she wants and asks for it. We now live in the outskirts of Miami in a town called Homestead. 
with our three stinky dogs, Maria, Dino, and Isa. We spend our days either at home exploring our interests through play, YouTube, movies, audiobooks, podcasts. We also like to visit family or hang out with our friends at parks and museums, or we try to find like, you know, interesting places to go explore with our friends. Um, this past year, we got an RV. Oh. So um, there's been a lot of learning for all of us, for my husband, for me, for the girls. And, you know, we're hoping to have like little weekend getaways, like at least once a month or once every two months. That's our, our new adventure that we're doing. Oh, wow. That does sound exciting. <laughs> Fun to explore just a little bit further afield, right? Exactly. So how about you, Erica? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Erica Ellis, and I'm also from Miami originally. Um, I went to school in Boston for college. I got a science degree, and I'm interested in everything. I feel like I heard Anna Brown mention that she's a scanner. I consider myself a scanner. I'm interested in literally everything. And so in school, I studied science, but I also studied art and music, and I was an English minor. Um, and so after my science degree, I went to film school, and that was where I met my husband. And so we moved out to LA for a while, and we're working in the film business. Um, but that's not a business that's very conducive to raising a family. And so uh, we both made the decision to step away and to start teaching. So he started teaching at the college level film production, and I started teaching high school science, <laughs> which I did, <laughs> which I did for a total of two years because it was a very difficult job that I did not enjoy almost at all. Um, you know, I felt like what 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 I was supposed to be giving the children was exactly what they did not need at this mm -hmm. moment you know they were yeah. um just becoming teenagers and they they had a lot going on personally and just it just felt like of course they don't want to be here they have so many other things uh to be working on and so it at the time i i called it an impossible job and i i agree with that still <laughs> to this day so and I, um when I was pregnant with my son, I planned on leaving at the end of that school year, and I did. Um, my son is now nine and a half, and my daughter is seven and a half. And so ever since then, I've just, I've uh, organized some mom groups, homeschool groups. I've taught mommy and me music classes, and mostly just hung out with my kids. Sweet. That sounds lovely. <laughs> <laughs> that's quite the the journey I, I love hearing you know all the all the little pieces that wove beforehand you know to get to where you are so that's really interesting so now let's take the next step and look at how you discovered unschooling and what your family's move to unschooling looked like and do you want to start this time Erica sure mm -hmm. um <laughs> so <laughs> I was really into school as a kid. I was a student who understood the system. I was good in the system. I never questioned it. Um, I questioned it when I became a teacher somewhat, of course, but, um, you know, I, I never envisioned myself as someone who would not be putting their children into school. But then my son, when he was, you know, about two, maybe, was when people started talking about preschool and thinking about those things. And I looked at who he was and how he was, and I couldn't see it happen. And his personality is he doesn't like expectations placed on him. He, if he knows you want him to do something, that is reason enough to not do it. Mm -hmm. And so that combined with um, praise is kind of meaningless to him. Prizes are meaningless to him. Um, if there was a group of children engaged in an activity all together doing the same thing, he would go somewhere else and do something else. And I was like, school is like everything that he doesn't like is what he would be expected to do in school. And I just couldn't see it happening without some fighting, you know, like with some, some people looking at him and saying, you're not doing this right, you know, but I thought he was great. 
And so I just couldn't, I couldn't do it. I couldn't put him into that situation where I would be hearing, you know, he, he needs to change or he needs to do this differently. And so I knew that I didn't want to send him, but I didn't really know what would happen instead. And so I think I initially found project-based homeschooling as an idea Mm -hmm. and thought that sounded pretty good because that would be following his interests. Um, So I kind of dove into that for a while. I didn't really ever do anything to him or with him, though. It was more just in my own mind, like imagining what could be. Um, And from there, I remember somebody was mentioning, now some people who are project-based homeschooling combine it with the curriculum, and some are unschoolers. And I was like, okay, so the curriculum won't work, so what is the unschooling version? Um, I was looking back through my emails, and I saw that I had joined Always Learning Yahoo group when he was four, so Mm -hmm. about when he was four was when I found that, and then Um, they mentioned your exploring unschooling email series, uh, uh, in that. And so then I joined that and had my husband join that. Um, and it's just from those early moments, just like a lot of mind blowing research, (laughs) reading and reading all of John Holt's books, John Taylor Gatto and Alfie Cohn. And I read de-schooling society and just, you know, I got really deep in into questioning everything and was completely blown away and actually really envious of all the kids who had been complaining about school back when I was in school. <laughs> yeah, because I was like, I wasn't smart enough to see what they saw back then. You know, I was just like accepting it all. And so um, it was kind of funny to then. At, at that point be like oh they were right (laughs) and I was just kind of going (coughs) for no good reason um but anyway it took a lot longer to get the parenting aspects and you know I'm still I still consider myself really in the de-schooling process at this point with a nine-year-old and a seven-year-old because things come up all the time where it's like I have to I have to stop all of that. I mean, I went to school for so long. Mm -hmm. I went to school and then college and then grad school and then school to become a teacher. (laughs) So it's a lot of layers of having to question myself. But thankfully, most of that happens inside my head where no one else really is knowing that that's even going on. And and my kids are just playing. So, um, yeah, Yeah, it's been great. Yeah, I recognize that because so much of it is our own, our own journey and our own work, right? Right. And does de-schooling like really end, Pam? Because it's like, (laughs) I feel like, okay, I'm comfortable with parenting a four-year-old, but I've never parented a 10-year-old and I've never parented a six-year-old that, you know, wants to have a YouTube channel. And it's like, you're constantly being faced with things that you're uncomfortable with, that you have to... You know, we talk in book club and I'm like, we really have to get comfortable with de-schooling because it's something like you're kind of, it's like you do often. And one of the other members of our book club, Michelle, she is about transitions. And Mm -hmm. it's like, it's a never ending transition. We're always in transition. And I think (laughs) that's what it was. We said transitions are hard and transitions are just all constantly. Constantly. I think Vicky, Vicky Benison, um, she was one of your recent, she said, had like this perfect quote about transitions and I'm like sending it to all of them. I'm like, look, <laughs> it's true. We're not the only ones. <laughs> uh, constantly in transition because right when you think like, I got this. <laughs> no, you don't. Because there's something else that you're uncomfortable with that you have to revisit that, okay. No. Let's de-school this little, this little piece. That, yeah, it's so true because, you know, at the beginning that, you know, when we talk about the de-schooling phase, you know, whether it takes a year or two, whatever, but you're right. That's kind of like the bulk that's, you know, all that stuff through school. It's like figuring out how learning doesn't need to look like school. 
right? It, it's figuring out those pieces, but you're right. There's always going to be pockets, always going to be new things that come up because we're learning and growing and, and life moves forward, right? Like you said, our, our kids get older and now all of a sudden it's like, oh, I've never really thought of this. I'm coming up against this new issue because it just hasn't, wasn't something that occurred to me to question before, right? To even think about and, and wonder what I would do. That's one of the reasons I really enjoyed um, <clears throat> reading um, the unschooling groups over the years was because you people would be asking questions and they'd have kids older than me, right? Or some question about something that my kids just hadn't come across, hadn't wanted to do or whatever. So I could kind of hypothetically think about those situations so that I was a little bit more prepared if it came up for us. But yeah, again, there's still something different between, you know, reading about it and thinking about it and it actually happening. But yeah, you're right. There's always, I mean, my kids are, are older now. They're, they're not unschooling per se, but there's still always, you know, something comes up, something interesting. And you think, hmm, I'm going to have to actually think through that because I've never really considered it before. <laughs> okay, so Tracy, um, your family's moved to unschooling. Um, like very similar to some of the families that you've had on the podcast, we, you know, embrace the attachment parenting, uh, with our, with our babies. And, um, but I had never heard about unschooling and this friend of mine started writing to me about it. And I was like, what? <laughs> this is for real? Like, this is real? Like people... And and I originally started researching it so I could like debate with her about it. Ah. And I, it's not that I was it's not that I was really like um, what's the word that I always forget? I'm conventional. not conventional. I wasn't like following like a conventional way of of child rearing or mm -hmm. but it was just so different than anything I had ever heard. And when I started reading and reading and going into the to Sandra Dodd's webpage and Joyce Federal and reading, you know, the threads on the Facebook group. I was like, it's like this little window in my brain opened and like all this light came in. And I was like, this is for real. There's families that are living like this. And it was so exciting. And I'm not a meditative, meditated reader. I'm, I gobble. I'm like, <laughs> I gorge everything I eat, like everything I'm reading. I'm like, oh, and then this. And you have like a stack of uh -huh. books. And it was just so exciting. And, um, and at the same time, I was researching the homeschooling community in South Florida and what was out there. And I found that exciting too, because I saw all the choices that there were. I would tell my mom, I don't know why people do all the same thing. There's so many different paths that you could take when you're thinking about the education of your child. And I, you know, went to every homeschooling 101, Q and A's, classical conversation, Charlotte Mason. This was my journey. I wasn't dragging the girls through all of this. Mm -hmm. At home, we were playing, we were attachment parenting, and I was de-schooling and reading and learning. So all these different things that I was researching was my, my stuff. Um, and then when our eldest turned five, my husband wasn't sold on the homeschooling. He was nervous about it. And when she turned five, he said, can we, can we just try school? And I, I didn't want to try it, but I knew that I wanted it to be a family decision. I knew that if I was pulling one way and he was pulling another, it was, it was not going to work. So, um, we put her, we started late. It was like September and we put her into an inclusion program. It was a small private school. And, um, and five months later he took her out. He came home and he said, La niña no regresa al colegio mañana. She's not going back to school tomorrow. And I was like, yes! <laughs> and he saw it himself. And it wasn't because he's attached to school because he's the first one to say he had a really tough experience his whole time in school, but he just couldn't see anything else. Yeah. But when he saw her change, because she never cried, she never 
but he saw like the the shine in her eyes kind of like go mm -hmm. he himself made that decision and it was great because we got on board we got together on it and that's always a really good feeling but it's been five years and there's still things that she's dragging with her from those five little months little things that still pop up that we're I mean I still have you know still haven't found a way to help her um other than just living the life and just focusing on you know you know what it is Pam <laughs> so um so that's how um it came a point once all the research that I had to pick a path mm -hmm. and and the unschooling one was the one that just excited me so much. And it just, it, it, it fit our life. It fit my daughter. Cause all those things that Erica said perfectly about, you know, not wanting your children to feel like there's something wrong with them or, you know, that was very powerful. And I completely was there with her. So, so yeah, that's how. And then once you're like, okay, I'm going to do this. You want to talk about it all the time. You know, <laughs> after you hear all of Amy's uh, Amy Child's podcast, you gobble up all, everything you can read. You you listen to Pam Larickia every, you know, week with the podcast. And then you're like, want to talk like with people about <laughs> it. And, and, and that, here we are. And here and we you are. are. <laughs> and you know what? <laughs> that leads so beautifully into the next question, doesn't it? Because I would love if you guys could give me an overview of your book club and I and an I idea of the flow of a typical meeting. So do you want to start with that, Tracy? Me? Sure. Yeah. Um because okay. <laughs> your opportunity to get together with people and talk about this stuff. Exactly. So yeah. my philosophy or like when I envision, and I still, when I envision our book club, I think of that beautiful th um, thing that Joyce Federal wrote about the, ba the balloon an analogy, the balloon analogy. Yeah. And that's book club. Like we're all in this circle and some of us have gotten really comfortable with letting go of some balloons, but we still have the ones that we're not ready to. And they're all different. And we kind of like inspire each other because mm -hmm. even though it's very exciting, the beginning of unschooling, when you discover it, it could feel a little lonely, even though there's so many places you can get in touch with people and there's like mentors at your fingertips now because of technology. Um, I felt a little lonely and, um, and reaching out to Erica to see if we could do this together. Um, what uh, was a lot of help. It was very helpful. Um, so when we originally started the book club, we wanted a book, that was not scary for somebody that was curious because we were opening it because um, we were opening it to a Facebook group that we have here, a local one. Mm -hmm. But we also wanted a book that was challenging for those people that had been de-schooling for a while. So that's how we got to Pamela Rickia oh. because um, your style of writing is very like empathetic, but you don't tiptoe around the topic. So it was a really good place to start. So we right. started so with, we start with free to learn, free to learn, um, because it is a good place to start for people who have no idea about unschooling and are just curious. Um, but it's one of those mm -hmm. where each, each chapter that we went to gave us so much, even, even for those of us who had been trying to do this for a few years, it still gave us a lot um, to confront within ourselves. It's one of, I forget, I feel like we, we say something like, it's like simple to read, you know, it's, it's not intimidating, it's clear. but it's, it'll still be mind blowing, right? Like you, you still get the big aha moments and it's also a good one because it's quick to read. And so we would do, you know, have, one book club session would be about 
one chapter, but then it would bring up so many personal stories that we would end up having way too much to talk about (laughs) at each meeting where, you know, we could just go on and on just based on this, the one idea. Yeah, we do one chapter a month. We meet once a month and we do one chapter and we all come if we've read, because if we haven't been able to read that month, that's fine too. come anyways, because you know, you're going to have something to share and we're going to have something to share too. And we just pretty much go page by page sharing. Oh, I, this quote, I love it. And then when we share a quote, it just opens up a path of like either a personal experience or even like, I find this really challenging. I don't understand it. So that's how that's kind of like the system that we use. We pretty much go page by page. So even if one of our members hasn't been able to read it that day, they still can. It's like they're reading. They're reading it and they're participating it. And, and the book is like a platform to, you know, dive deeper and deeper and deeper. Yeah. For things to pop up. Mm -hmm. When we first started the book club, we, just were meeting at each other's houses, kind of taking turns. And that actually helped us get to know each other quicker, I think, you know, to get into each other's houses. But um, one week or one month, we went to our friend Michelle's house and she has a club room at her building. And once we went there, (laughs) we were like, all right, this is it now. (laughs) This is where the club lives because no one to clean up their living room no one has to you know it it's just a nice big place uh, with plenty comfy seating and yeah it it makes it easy for us so Mm -hmm. since then since we found that that's been our spot and um we usually meet for at least four hours and usually Start at 8 p.m. usually, you know, to give our, you know, our husbands a chance to have dinner, be done, you know, kind of let them have an easier night with the kids. And then, um, so we start at 8 p.m. and I've gotten home at 2 a.m., maybe later than 2 a.m. sometimes. And the time just flies by. Like from eight to midnight is like, and at midnight we have to be out of the, out club, of the room. club room. So sometimes so then, <laughs> then we move on to book club in the after hours garage. after our book club. <laughs> book club in the hall. <laughs> we just can't stop because yeah, we get on a roll and it's it's too fun. Well, it's it is like the conversation is fascinating, isn't it? It's it's so interesting. Just unschooling itself, you know. <laughs> Hence why I have so many podcast episodes (laughs) because it's fascinating to talk about other people's experience, getting other people's perspective on things, you know, when it's so nice when somebody is like kind of looking through the same lens as you, right? So, you know, you're not going to be getting all the conventional advice um, to a situation or conventional feedback, you know, the answer is, well, you should put them in school. You're not, you don't have to worry about that. So you can kind of just help each other out brainstorming things, you know, plus most people don't have the expectation that, that you'll like do what they say. They're just sharing perspectives and sharing information, right? It's just such a fun way to have a conversation. Yeah. We have a lot of brainstorming sessions. Yeah. Like it probably took a year for um for everybody to kind of start opening up and and um and arriving with questions or you know I experienced this and I don't know what to do and it's really I mean I find it fun looking at something and seeing the other side of it and what's the, you know, maybe the, Oh, and, and like maybe one of the moms in the, um, in the, in the book club has more of a personality that is like your child. And they give you like this other side that you're like, Oh my God, this is not such a big deal. Cause they'll that be like, me so that much. helps a lot. I had a story where I felt like things, I was so connected with my son and like having this wonderful moment. And then out of nowhere, he was like, I hate you. I was like, 
what what is that why (laughs) why why did that happen and so I talked about that in book club and one of the moms was like oh I would have said that to my mom too I'm just really uncomfortable with when things get too much lovey-dovey you know too Uh close I have to do something to put some separation again and I was like all right so that's it's just his personality that was too he got that feeling a little bit too much and he needed to to do something about right. it. And so just hearing that that was, was someone's um, experience that helped so much in that moment. Very helpful. Yeah, yeah. That's wonderful. Now you guys were talking about, you know, how, how it took has taken like a year or so of, of meeting. You, you guys are meeting once a month um, to get to a comfortable place. And I remember when we were talking earlier, you guys mentioned having icebreakers at the beginning of your meeting. Um, and I love that, that I think it helps facilitate a little bit that getting to know each other. So I wanted to dive into that a bit more. So I wanted to hear about what your experience has been with that. And if you might share some icebreaker examples that could help people kind of get the, those brainstorming juices flowing. (laughs) Yes, it was, it was a a really great tool for us to get to know each other and kind of get everybody comfortable with, um, with you just sharing so much of yourself because you're, you're you're this is not a book club about a fiction uh, mm-hmm. book. It's like you're talking about you and your life and your family and everything that matters to you. So, um, so we would start with um, icebreakers, and here's a couple of them I found in my notes. It would be things like name three favorite personality traits of each of your children. So um, you would share that or what, what, you know, things that your children love, like their passion. So on top of the fact of getting to know each other, we were getting to know each other's children. Um, One of my favorite was um, what personality traits have your children cultivated in you? And most of the time I would go first because I have had the longest time to think about the question. Yeah, yeah, so I yeah. thought it was unfair. So for example, I, my eldest daughter softened my heart, helps me with patience and playfulness. My younger daughter has taken my curiosity to a whole new level, pushing me out of my comfort zone, learning about technology and online gaming and makeup and, and, And also because we're a lot alike, I get to see some of my personality traits in her that for so long I thought they were negative because for me they felt like a burden. But seeing those personality traits in her, they look just like so awesome. (laughs) So I start thinking, I'm like that. You know, that's cool about me. (laughs) So um, those are like little examples I really liked um, one of the first ones. She asked us what we are interested in and what we've been learning without school, you know, and that everyone got so excited about that question. It was just like, I never get to talk about the things that I'm interested in. And, you know, it was kind of like each person would say, well, I'm interested in all of what they say. (laughs) And then all (laughs) <laughs> and we're like oh yes that too you know and so it really everyone was it really livened up the whole thing and got everyone talking I loved that question too yeah that those, it was really fun now nowadays after almost two years we don't need much to open up like we come in already like guys this happened can we bring about this yeah before we start the book could we please just address my issues like that's how it is <laughs> which is awesome yeah no I love the way those questions um <gasps> They, they were focusing on, on like positive stuff, but they were focusing and, and it wasn't even, it's not even unschooling like, like per se. Right. But it's all stuff that, um, helps people get closer to unschooling, right? Like looking at the personalities, seeing the positive aspects of it, you know, even noticing our own interests, you know, all that stuff are great questions that we want to ask ourselves as we're considering unschooling, but to keep asking ourselves, right. To stay on top of. So I thought those were amazing examples. (laughs) 
So uh, let's move to the next question. How you choose a book? I love the way you chose the first book. Well, Erica, Erica I has a good response to that. All right, all right. Erica, how do you choose a book? So far, the way we choose a book is we just go right in order of what did Pam write next. <laughs> and then we'll do that one. <laughs> but... In all honesty, that is basically what we've done. But it's because that first book is such a good starting place. So we started with that. And then Free to Live flowed so nicely from there. And then Unschooling Journey came out while we were doing our book club. And we all got the book. We all had it like this. And it's this beautiful thing. And so we were like, well, should we move to someone else? And then we're like, well, not yet. This (laughs) book is just so beautiful. We need to do this Because then we could do coloring in book club too (laughs) and so that's what we're doing now so we're on unschooling journey and we actually don't know what the process will be like to pick a book outside of the Pam Lurikia yeah we we this I said okay okay ladies we'll do a Pam trilogy and then we'll find an we'll find find another another book yeah (laughs) so far that's it so far okay that's very cool thank you (laughs) I mean we've always I mean like we ha- at, at the beginning, we had we taught we, you know we took into consideration the different um, levels. Like if somebody had just was just starting, mm-hmm. or somebody had been de schooling for a while, and we took that into consideration. And that was one of the things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's that it, just, it. Really, just has flowed, you know, without much consideration from that point because it just made sense to do that one and then. So, but one of the I things that I enjoy doing um, when facilitating the book club is I find all, I mean, there's so many wonderful writers and mentors that we have. And I'll bring like a little clip from a podcast or a quote from another writer that has to do with the, the subject the or the topic. Yeah. And that way to bring other voices, because sometimes, you know, people have different voices that help them understand the process better. So I try to incorporate sometimes a little video or, um, yeah, we bring quotes like those little, you know, meme quote things yeah, are yeah. good in a group and stuff. So yeah. to tie yeah. it in with the topic. So that's kind of what you guys do as the facilitators, right? Cause you know what the next chapter is going to be. So you think a little bit ahead and, and find some other stuff, um, that connects with it. Cause that, uh, widens the conversation, right? Yeah. Brilliant. Okay. So now you said you guys are coming up on two years now and, um, you started by inviting people from a local Facebook group that you guys had. So I know, um, that, you know, when you think about starting one, you might, um, want to keep your you might be thinking about open uh, open membership you know just putting out a call if there's anybody in the area who might be interested or maybe you already know some local people and you might want to just go invite only people that you know are you interested in participating um, so I think that you know those are two distinct different ways to go and they even might change over time maybe as your book hub grows because you might start to hit a number where where your four hour meetings become six if everybody wants that (laughs) opportunity right so I was just wondering if you could talk a bit about um kind of maybe the pros and cons of those two ways to go about it well I think we both have a like a feeling of wanting this for everyone Mm -hmm. so it's hard to want to close it because I want everyone to have this opportunity. I want everyone to learn about unschooling. Um, And so when we started it, it was just part of our local unschoolers Facebook group. And and Tracy posted that we were going to have a book club. Anyone can come. And it stayed like that for the first two books, two books. So like a year and a half, um, we did it like that where anyone could come. Still, most of the time, the same people would come, but then we would have every once in a while, someone else would show up and contribute and ask questions and things. So, Yes, um, we liked when we would have like special guests like come to, to, to check it out, but a lot of the times 
when we entered the second book, they had all these questions and they were like excited and curious. And so a lot of the time of the book club became about answering this, these, the questions, which was great for us because it's practice for us. Cause you know, you start really understanding something when you are able to explain it to somebody else. Mm -hmm. So those moments, I enjoyed them because I, I like talking to people and having somebody new and, um, and being able to, you know, explain something that I'm passionate about and start having the vocabulary for it. Mm -hmm. But eventually we closed it, not because of the size, but because of the, the depth. Like we started getting really deep into the conversations and sharing a lot of intimate stuff and challenges that we have personally. And like there's different kinds of personalities. I might be a person that I feel comfortable sharing something deep in a month, but there's personalities that might need three or four months to start opening up. And then finally this person is ready to be like reach out. And then there's a new person there that, so yeah, it changes um, the dynamic. It changes the dynamic. So when we decided we were going to do the the unschooling journey, we said, you know, Erica made the suggestion, and we all agreed. But then we were like, we have a, a Facebook group that you know we want to ha still have this available to them. So Erica had this great idea, and she started a virtual book club through our face our unschooling facebook group and in that and it's what is unschooling and she's it's it's something new it's the first time we've, we've done it and like once. yeah we've done it once we've gone through the round and you know we're, we're learning about it i think at first i was like because i love so much like the people the people part with them mm -hmm. but it was really great she really did a great job um organizing it and and, and very open to people talking. It was very comfortable. It's hard. It's hard to get. I think that forming a book club group is challenging. And I think it, it would take patience um, and time to get a group that works together. And I, I think that the virtual one is hard because people are coming from so many different levels mm -hmm. and some people are ready to fight about it. <laughs> and some people are, you know, already unschooling and, you know, it's just, it's hard to balance all of that. And I think we were lucky in a certain way that, that the people who kept coming back to our book club were kind of all on that, on a similar part of the path yeah. where we all had, you know, we were committed. We I think that it. was really good. I think good. that's what it is. We wanted it. Um, yeah. That, that we all wanted to learn and grow and, and we wanted to be unschoolers and good unschoolers, you know, like that, that was important to have the book club be successful. I think, I think there's, a big place for a book club that could invite people who are still in that very skeptical position too, though. And I want, I want personally to be part of that because I want to help people, you know, to be able to get into this lifestyle, but it's hard. And, and I don't, I don't think personally that I have enough time <laughs> to like have all of these in-person book clubs that I want to have, but I don't know. We're, we're trying to figure out how we can do both, how we can have this group that is fully committed and deep into our journey and then also still be able to support newer unschooled. And I say that it's closed, but it's not that it's closed. Like if we're, we're, you know, it's like if somebody really wants to dive in, we would gladly have them. It's mm -hmm. just that if they got to a point that we, it couldn't be about um, starting in school to square one, like right. going back to the beginning, which I, that's what I like about the virtual because, you know, you practice the answers. It's like, mm -hmm. you, it's, yeah. yeah. I'm yeah. Stuck. I'm I mean, it, it obviously was getting people to think, which is the whole point of it. It's just hard to engage at the same level online that you can do in person. Yeah, no, because I mean, that's when it's most helpful, right? When you meet them where they are. And if you dive too deep for them, it, it just won't make sense. Um, it won't connect to their experience where they are right now. So yeah, I can see why the need to keep them as different things, because you're meeting people at such very different levels, right?
Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it could sound like if you're visiting the group, it, it could. What's that word where something is like it feels like it's an insider thing? Like it's like um, esoteric. Esoteric. It's it's, like it's it's not even it's not practical. It's not. Yeah, like if if we've been together for so long that sometimes we have conversations that sound like. Maybe to somebody else, or like, what are they talking? What it, what yeah. are they saying? Yeah, and um, and I didn't ever want anyone to feel like we had a like it's this I have arrived type of thing because it's <laughs> yeah. it's not it's a journey that's the journey is the perfect analogy for it. Um, but you start understanding things different way, like the Sandra Dodd uh, thing that she says about the postcard. That if you go back to the postcard, you start seeing the colors. Like when yeah. you first looked at it, it was in black and white. But when you revisit that, you start seeing all the colors. And that's what happens. So, yeah. yeah, if someone comes into the book club who has not considered not using a curriculum before, and all of our questions are about um, relationships and, <laughs> you know, like really more intense personal things. It just, it's such a, it's not, we're not on the same conversation. Yep. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> we talk about that so much, right? Cause at the beginning, it's all about replacing the learning. Cause that's what we see unschooling as, right? So it is all about the learning, figuring out, well, how are they learning if they're not l using a curriculum, et cetera. So that's the level that you're on. Once you start to see the learning everywhere and you understand that learning's always happening and that what you can do to best facilitate the learning is have those rich, strong, connected relationships. And then all the conversations are about the relationships, right? <laughs> yeah. <Yep. laughs> oh, that's awesome. Okay. So um, I think you guys have touched on this, but I did want to ask um, what if you could talk a little bit about what you personally have gotten out of being part of the book club. Um, I really wanted this unschooling life, yeah. but I was feeling very lonely through the personal work that comes with unschooling. But at that moment, I did not know that the personal work is part of unschooling. It, it is the unschooling. You know, I, for a while there, I thought, man, I, I might just be too jerky of a person to be a good unschooler. Or am I ever going to get past my, you know, overcome myself and my personality and my selfish, selfishness to unschool right? And having the book club really helped me like charge my battery, you know, it, it, oh, what's that word? Like when you have somebody that you have to, that you have, um, it's like you have to walk your talk when you have a circle like this, they keep you honest, um, honest. There's a, um, a word, but it's not coming to me. I'm sorry. Um, So I'm sorry, I got stuck there. <laughs> and, and and it's gone. What it's brought to me is pretty much, I have been in these moments where I'm feeling overwhelmed, like whatever the situation is. Mm -hmm. And we always, you know, we always talk about not to be reactive, take a breath, like all the things um, that our mentors advise us to do. Um, and I have this group of ladies that I can write them a message and say, I'm in Toys R Us. I'm about to lose it because my daughter wants to spend $75 on a Hatchimal. Please give me a different perspective. And through the breathing, I have these ladies that are like, they're always, they're going to stand up for my, for my daughters. They're going to give, they're going to remind me of their perspective. They're going to, you know, remind me there's learning in that. It's, it's, it's a really great support in a good way. The good support, yeah. the ones that keeps you accountable, the accountable support, the support that doesn't leave you in the same place, but helps you, you know, love that. get closer get closer to what 
what you want, yeah, which yeah. is relationship with your children and not even just with your children, with your spouse, with your parents, with your friends. And it's the good kind of support, the support that says, um, I, I understand I've been there, but what about this? And so you're not stuck. Right. You know, sometimes yeah, like, because in those moments it, we can when you're feeling stuck, right? It, you're so much in that tunnel vision. You can't see all those. And to be able to reach out and help have some people who can just quickly remind you of that bigger picture, those other pieces when you're stuck like this. That's amazing. Yeah, yes. that's wonderful. Awesome. <laughs> Related to that, I feel like one of the great things is because these other moms know so much about the challenges that I have, the challenges that my kids have, and then also also like the you know the things that we're looking forward to they just have so much backstory so that when we hang out together, when our kids are doing things, they understand my excitement or, you know, my frustration or whatever it is at such a, a higher level. There was one time when, um, you know, for many years, my son was really afraid of amusement park rides. Like he, he couldn't see if my daughter wanted to go on one, he would sit and cry knowing that she was on it. You know, he was very anxious about it. And so it was something that, you know, we didn't, there was never any pressure and we supported him through him feeling upset about it. But then he got to a point when he matured and, and wanted to go on a merry-go-round. And so we went on the carousel and I took a picture and posted it on Facebook. And to most people, it would be like, yeah, kids on a carousel. That's what they like to do. You know, it's fine. But of course the book club moms are like, Oh my gosh. (laughs) (laughs) They were, they were so excited because they knew how much had, had come before that and knew about the growth. And it just, you know, it it felt so good to have that, like someone really knowing about us. Yeah. But it's like it's really everybody being everybody being seen, right? I mean, it it feels good both ways to be seen and and like have your family seen, but also to see others, right? And to understand them to that to that depth. That's beautiful. I love that, guys. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Sounds like you got a wonderful group. I know. <laughs> we should do a shout out to them. <laughs> we will. We'll say all their names before. <laughs> okay. So I just want to take one step back into your unschooling lives again. And I just thought I'd touch base and ask what's something that you're loving about just the flow of your unschooling lives right now? Yeah, go take okay. it. Take it, girl. Um, take it. Well, take my it. initial thought is time. I feel like people, I mean, everywhere, I'm sure, but Miami seems to take it to a whole new level of this intensity of you have to do all these, you know, these things. There's never enough time to do what you want to do. And you have to rush the kids to all these activities and starting when they're two, they have to be in all these classes and you know, just a a very intense version of time. And then I was thinking that when I was a child, how slowly time seemed to go. We were always counting down the days to when something good would happen or counting the minutes until the school day would end. And I loved school and I still did that, you know, like (laughs) it was, it still felt like, oh, you know, five more minutes. Oh, (laughs) My kids have a completely different view of time. They feel like time goes fast. They're always like, it's nighttime already. And like, I feel like it was just Christmas and here we are again. Or, you know, (laughs) things like that. Just their time flies by because they're having fun, I guess. You know, (laughs) it's like our lives are, it has a more relaxed, open feeling where we're, we can let things last as long as we want them to. We schedule play dates that are open-ended, you know, anytime we go to the park, it's open-ended. We take long vacations rather than trying to cram in things quickly. So it's just a different life than what, what most people are used to. And I feel like it gives us a greater chance to connect with ourselves and with each other 
Um, I just love, I love that feeling of our life that we are not in a rush. I love that. That's, that's a good one, Eric. <laughs> I, I have a couple. I have a couple. Okay. Um, my first one was uh, the choices. Like all the choices that we have. I, I know that there was a time in my life where I didn't feel like I had a lot of choices and it was either this or that. I know it because I, but I don't remember. I, I, this is one little piece of uh, that I, I, I have embraced and I understand. And it's the idea that we have so many choices, so many choices that, that everybody's needs in, in our family can be met and we can have a good time. And sometimes some of us have to wait a little bit or, but at the end, it's, it's just like, a lot of choices, a lot of choices. And then the um, when we were talking about the question, she goes, the, everybody says, you know, the, the, the good one is relationships. <laughs> um, and I'm like, I'm like, yeah, that's I'm, I'm right going to, yeah, that's the right answer. I was like, the right answer is relationships. <laughs> and I go, I have relationships, but it's not in that way. Because honestly, right now, the stage that we are, sometimes yeah. I don't feel like I have a good relationship with my daughters just because we it's argue and we're transitioning. We're trying to find different ways to get everybody's needs met. And so there's debates, there's arguments. So you automatically think, oh, because you argue, you don't have a good relationship. And that's in one of the steps I'm taking. No, not necessarily, you know, I'm, just because you uh, you you choose unschooling doesn't mean that you're going to stop being human or your child is going to stop being human. You're going to be human and you're going to have disagreements, especially when they start um, saying, yeah, that sounds good, but I'm going to do what I want to do. You know, like like it's before when they're little, you're like, come on, let's do this. And they're like, sure. And they come and then one day, <laughs> one day they realize that they don't have to do that, that they prefer doing something else. And you're like, Oh, okay. Now this is different and this is new. And how am I gonna, how am I gonna do this to, you know? So, um, the, the point that I'm trying to make is that our lives is very relationship centered um, in the sense that that's what we work on a lot. Um, a couple of years ago, my daughter started arguing a lot and I wanted to walk in and say, you're right, you're wrong. Give her that. This is done. Mm -hmm. And and it just was a lot of friction. And one day I was in the middle of rushing through this uncomfortable feeling of arguing. And this little voice inside said, what are you doing? This is it. This is unschooling. This is, this is what you're, this is the reason why you're doing this. Why are you rushing through this? This is it. Stop reading about it. And this is your chance to practice it. And when I saw that that was, that this is it, it helped me. It helped me really take advantage of those times and really focus on the relationship. Now, Pam, that doesn't mean that I don't have days that I'm like, come on, girls, let's wrap this up. This is, you know, still, you know, it happens. But more and more, I pick the slowing down. Okay, what, well, you know, the talking, like more and more, I, 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 I it's easier for me to choose that. Mm -hmm. Um and the relationship center part has bled into everything because now when, you know, with our family, my youngest is a, a gamer girl. She says she's a gamer girl and she games with her friends. She's six and they do FaceTime and they get into arguments in Minecraft and in Roblox that kids get on the playground. It's like exactly the when you like spend time with them and you sit with them, you're like, these are the same exact arguments that they would be having if they were running around in a playground, you know, taking turns and you killed me and you took my sword. And, and it, it becomes about the relationship of your friends. You, you have the time to really say, well, you know, let's see, how, how could your friend have understood that? I don't think he meant this. And, and so it's, uh, I'm really, it's hard. <laughs> it's hard for me because 
I think a lot of people want to rush through the uncomfortable feelings. I don't think I'm the only one. But um, but taking that time and and eventually, I think all of this, you know, 10 years from now, when they're teenagers, I will be able to say, well, my favorite part of unschooling is our relationship. Because, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. um, you know, so- sometimes now I'm like... <laughs> My expectations get the best of me. And I tell Eric and the ladies at Book Club, I'm like, I, I, I fed on demand. I co-sleep. I say yes. Why don't they just want to do everything I say? <laughs> Why? Why? And so those expectations um, can get you. Yeah. Can really like, get you. Don't they see don't they what see? we're doing for them <laughs> <laughs> this is gonna pay off <laughs> oh my goodness. you know Tracy I just I love that whole bit about relationships because you're right that is the thick of unschooling now I mean there were so many really cool aspects in there to touch on okay first the virtual relationships versus the on the playground that's like I love that observation I remember making I remember that aha moment for myself and it was when you know my son as a teen was working through like so he would come and chat with me about what was going on and um you know relationships wise online and what they were navigating and everything and my daughter you know also a teen was like in girl guides and doing stuff in town and everything and she was talking to me about the relationships and and what was going on and who was doing what and who was saying what and the conversations were practically the same like they were learning the same kinds of things about managing relationships and and how to walk through different kinds of situations they were just doing it in two different environments so you know all that oh what they're sitting at home in the basement gaming they're never going to learn how to get along with people it's like no they're they're learning the same things about relationships their their relationships just happen to occur in different environments Right. So I love that observation that you're seeing that, too, with the with the younger kids. You know, that just makes it even more solid. I love um, the idea, you know, talking about and sharing that this isn't like one time thing. Right. When being with our kids in those moments when they're arguing or we're trying to figure out what we're going to do, because I would I wish you would just, you know, do this with us. <laughs> so often, you know, people will come and ask that question and they, they want an answer, right? It's like, well, how do I do this so that this doesn't happen again? But that's not what it is either, right? This is how we, this is how we're learning about each other, how we're figuring out how to live together. We're learning about ourselves so much because in a situation like that, we need to kind of explain why we do or don't want i mean it's not that not that they're not allowed to leave the conversation until they explain themselves but they learn they figure out that being able to explain helps right to be able to say you know i don't feel like doing that but gee i'd i'd be happy to do that next week because right now i'm busy with this you know so that level of that that really encourages a level of self awareness for them that they can bring to the conversation and then learning about each other but absolutely cuz i remember you know it was a probably a good a good year when my kids first came home from school so now they were spending a lot of time together right all three of them were in school up until so joseph Joseph, so there were nine, seven, and four, and the eldest were just about to turn 10 and eight when they came home. So yeah, that first year was so much of my time invested in helping them and learning myself. Like we were all learning how to navigate these kinds of situations, right? And it's not... If I could just say the right thing, everybody would be happy. Yeah, good relationships doesn't equal happy people. You know what I mean? That's why I always talk about relationships as being connected, you know, strong, connected, trusting, because, and that's what you're doing in those times. You're building that connection. You're building that trust. Like 
trust is what you guys have built in that book club, right? That connection and trust that you've built over these couple of years now so that now you can get right into those conversations. That's that's what you're kind of aspiring to with your children when you're going through all this stuff, just being in relationship with each other. You're building that connection, that deep understanding of each other. You're building that trust that, you know, people mean what they say and they're going to follow through with what they say and, and people are going to listen to me. I'm going to be seen. I'm going to be heard. I'm talking a lot for me now, you know, <laughs> a guest on my own show. But I, you know, you just spark so many things in me, Tracy, because, you know, we're back to that that relationship piece, right? And And that expectation that, oh, you know, we're not getting along because we're not all agreeing at first. No, that's not a measure of a good relationship that we all want to do the same stuff at the same time, right? Or, <laughs> or that, you know, we're always happy to, you know, get along, to share, whatever, whatever. That's not the point. Those aren't the goals. When, when we talk about the strong, connected relationships that we love, it's, it's because we can work through those moments, not because we all agree all at the same time. You know, does that make sense? <laughs> Yes. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we all, like, if we talk about it and we analyze it, um, like not from a personal sense, because sometimes we get our buttons pushed, but we say, okay, we want, we want our children to say what they mean and, you know, stand up for themselves. And we're the first place. If they feel confident enough to stand up to us, that's it. It's like, they'll be able to up to so many things or stand up for stand up for mm -hmm. yesterday my six-year-old I was frustrated because I was picking up and and she's just she's so bright she goes to me right now we were just putting the horse away and you were really nice and all of a sudden now you're not nice anymore and I'm like what do you mean she's like to me I was just the same but she could tell yeah. and she's calling me on it. And I've always told her if, if I don't sound right, or if I'm hurting you, you tell me mama, you're, I don't like the way you're, you're speaking to me. And she has taken me up on it and she tells me, and then it gives me the opportunity to sit down and breathe and tell her, oh, I'm sorry. You're right. I'm taking it out on you. I'm just, you know, and it just, there's our conversation. There's, there's, you know, there's, there's this beautiful meme that says something like there's something more important than perfection. And, and that's what it is. It's, it's not being perfect and just being together and understanding each other. And it's just, it's beautiful. It's life. Yeah. And I find, you know, sometimes it is easier for us to stop when our kids call us on it, like mention it, notice it, because all, you know, right or wrong, all of a sudden it's for them at first, you know, because we get in our head when we start getting frustrated. It's like, oh, I'm going to finish this. I'm going to just do this, you know, and then and we get all stuck and grumpy, but we don't give ourselves that time and that space to breathe through it before we act. We just like power through, right? Yeah. You know, and then, but when they call us on it, that's like, oh, okay, I'm going to take a moment. And then, and then we can shift, you know, more often than not. And, and it's another level of self-awareness for us, right? It's like, oh, look how I got caught in that, you know, and, and that, look, I can still accomplish, do what I was wanting to do, but come at it from a totally different mindset. And all of a sudden everything's working out so much better. <laughs> Exactly. Look, I want to show you something. Okay. <laughs> At the end of one of our video chats that we had with you after your book, yeah, I made this. I don't know. Do you see it backwards? Does she see no. it backwards? No. It I says see it the repair piece is the most important piece. Pamela Rickia. Uh -huh. and that, and I, you know, I drew it with a, a big puzzle piece because that was the piece that I was missing. I was missing that that's part of relationships. What do we do when we mess up and how do we make it better and how do we reconnect? And you know what? You might have to put in a little time to win that trust again. 
Mm-hmm. And I just, because I was their mother, I didn't think I had to do that. I did all this other stuff. So they should just trust, trust. me. That's it. Right. Yep. But it's not, it's a relationship that has to be constant. It, 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 but it, it's, it's like, what is the alternative to that when you think about it? Because if, if I lose my cool, which I do regularly still, um, it's, that's already happened. So I can either stay inside myself and feel guilty and do nothing having to do with them, or I can try to repair it. So it's like, it becomes obvious, but I think that when I think about it, you know, it's hard, it's hard to not just immediately go to beating yourself up and be like, I just shouldn't be that way. I shouldn't have such a quick temper. I shouldn't have lost my cool, but that's all in the past. So yeah, it, it seems obvious now, (laughs) but it's not at first. It's like, okay, so now that that's done, the repair piece is the most important. Oh, I love that. I love that, Erica. It's a great way to look at it, that that's, that's already done. Now I'm going to make my best choice now, like for the person that I want to be. And when you get in the unschooling journey to the chapter on temptation, (laughs) That's the beauty. <laughs> That's the part of the journey where you realize that it's not about trying to become this perfect person who can resist all these moments and not be, you know, never, never get angry or never lose my cool or never be tempted, but whatever. I mean, that's, that's kind of the metaphor for that chapter, but yeah, it's realizing, oh, that's part of the journey. That's being human. That's okay. It's recognizing it and moving through it. That's, that's us. You know, that's, that's life. That's the unschooling. It's not beating yourself up with guilt for the fact that, oh crap, you know, I, I did something that I didn't want to do. You know what I mean? Because, you know, knowing that we're all human and we're choosing this journey anyway, you know, like you were talking about everybody in your, your book group has chosen. This is, this is the journey that they want to take the path they want to walk. So that's so much more helpful when, cause you're all on that journey together versus you know, people coming in who are still trying to decide whether or not that's the journey they want to take. Anyway, guys, I want to thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate the time and, and the time where we lost the call and (laughs) all that stuff. I really appreciate you guys sticking around. We really appreciate you, Pam and, and you and all the other mentors that are out there in the unschooling community. The work you do is really meaningful for our families and um are we going to do a shout out to the book club can we shout out out? (laughs) absolutely so we want to thank michelle and nicole and donies and and lizbeth and And arlene 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 had to move but she's she's still part of um (laughs) the the book club you know so um i know you can connect virtually into that beautiful room (laughs) 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 okay so before we go where's the best place for people to connect with you online maybe they have a book club question oh sure um so i'm on facebook i'm in a lot of the groups um probably unschooling mom to mom radical parenting is kind of quiet right now but they could probably find me by doing a search in there um our facebook group is called south miami unschoolers and it's only for local unschoolers but if someone wanted to ask us a question through there that would be fine too yeah i'm i'm part of um of the groups as well, the Facebook, the unschooling Q and A is one that I like to read a lot, and the radical unschooling info. Um, I, I'll give you my personal Facebook in case somebody wants to send me a message, so you can link. Okay. Um, yeah, I'll put all those links in the show notes. Sound good? <laughs> Sounds great. Thank you so much, Pam. This Thank was you. so exciting. <laughs> <laughs> it was so fun. I really appreciate all that you guys shared. It was it was a really great conversation. Thank you so much. Have a great Thank day, you. guys. Bye. Bye. Bye.